Okay, hello, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Tertulia. My name is Christy Elaine, and I'm from St. Thomas University. And on behalf of our Tertulia group, we wanna welcome you. Our organizing committee is uh, Tracy Glynn from St. Thomas University, Daniel Tubb from UNB, um, and Matthew Hayes from STU. We wanna thank our, um, our sponsors for tonight or a sponsor, which is the Tobik River Trading Company and our partner, the MB Media Co-op. To begin, we'd like to uh, acknowledge that the organizers for this event tonight are on the unceded Willistiquay territory. And I think this is especially important. Uh, these territories are governed by the treaties of peace and friendship and especially important to think about these issues today, given that we're sitting in the middle of treaty recognition week. So we'd ask that we spend a bit of time thinking about that. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Matthew to introduce tonight's speaker. Welcome to uh, uh, our tertulia for tonight. Our speaker is gonna be Karen Robert. She's a um, professor of world history at St. Thomas University. Uh, she's an expert in uh, Latin America, especially uh, Argentina, where she spent some time and done some work. Um, she is uh, currently in the process of working on a book, uh, Driving Fear, the Ford Falcon is icon of Argentina's Cold War terror. Mm -hmm. And she's going to talk to us tonight about a character who's um, uh, very important in Latin America and perhaps also in Latin America and the Cold War. So looking forward to hearing about this. All right, hi everybody. So I thought I would, uh, well, I may, maybe I'll start with a caveat. <laughs> well, I'll give you a little background. I know I watched Tom Beckley's, uh, um, Tom Beckley's uh, Tertullia and I thought I would give you a similar background. Um, uh, so who am I to talk about Paulo Freire? So I wanna say, first of all, I would not say I am a up-to-date current expert on Frarian theory and critical pedagogy as it is practiced sort of post Paulo Freire. In fact, my original interest in Paulo Freire came about as young as Tom Beckley was when he got interested in Wendell Berry, maybe a couple of years older. Um, and I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Paulo Freire in 1988 when the Cold War was still on. Um, and I uncovered some really interesting things, actually, and ridiculously, it would be good advice to give students. I actually, now that I've looked at where the literature went after then, my undergraduate honors thesis on Paulo Freire was a publishable book. Did I do anything with it? Nah. I went off and did other stuff. <laughs> my thesis advisor at the time said, this is publishable. And I said, no, I don't think so. And I shoved it in a drawer and I pulled it out when Matthew said he'd be interested in hearing about Paulo Freire. <laughs> so uh, this, but I have obviously, so I'm a historian of Cold War Latin America. I would say this is absolutely my expertise. And so I was interested in revisiting Paulo Freire for a couple of reasons. One, I, I can make sense of him now in that context with hindsight that we did not have in 1988, obviously. Um, and we can certainly talk, of course, about um, what we can learn from Freire at this particular moment. Um, so maybe I'll say that first and then I'll get into the details. So there's two ways I think that Freire um, is deeply relevant today. One, well, there's many other reasons, but two I can think of for myself in my mind right now. One is I think that this, uh, push to online education, the, you know, the, the chaos of COVID and the way it has forced us all to completely rethink how we're teaching, not at the level of technology. I mean, at first it seemed to be about technology, but once the dust settles and we try to actually do something meaningful, we realize the technology is only a small part of it. It's the connection. It's the being forced to drill down and think about what is really important. Um, what is really important is the student's humanity and how, with all of these barriers, do we build a sort of dialogue, as we'll see with Perry. How do we build a, a dialogic relationship with students with all this mediating technology and all of this stress? And of course, the other reason I think um, Freire is relevant, and I'll make this point in my discussion, is of course, uh, Freire was operating uh, in state, one state after another, uh, that uh, 
where fascism was on the rise. Uh, and so the Cold War era in Latin America is extremely relevant uh, to what he was thinking he was going to do in the 1940s and, and what happened politically in Latin America. Um, and I don't really have a full answer to, because like I said, I haven't worked on a work on Ferrari anymore. I can't really, I can point you to some books. I can't really tell you precisely what that meant to Ferrari's later work. Um, but I can say something about that political context and the moment in which we find ourselves, of course, with this sort of proto-fascist ascendancy around the world and what maybe those of us who are educators, what place do we have within that reality? How can we um, help our students to be strong and critical thinkers and active citizens? So speaking of technology, I am now going to try to share my screen. So, um, so, I wanted to say, I'll say a couple of words about Paulo Freire, very bio, you know, very basic biography, who he was, what was significant about him. Um, and then I'm, well, I'll tell you in a second. So Paulo Freire is born in 1921, died in 1997. Um, he is probably one of the most important Latin American intellectuals of the 20th century and the most globally influential uh, Latin American in intellectuals. Uh, he was an educator and a, and a philosopher from Brazil. He had strong ties to progressive Catholic movements in Latin America and beyond and was kind of, he influenced and was in turn influenced by the early practices and ideas of liberation theology in Latin America. Um, and later he came to be really an intellectual of the decolonization anti-colonial movement. Uh, he traveled to India and South Africa and really was deeply influential on, uh, in terms of liberating pedagogy around the world. He is today considered one of the founding and most important figures of credit in critical pedagogy. Um, and in my uh, expertise. One thing that interests me is to see again how his career fits within the context of the Latin American Cold War. Um, and I'm going to line him up with some other people you might have heard of uh, to think about where he, what kinds of experiences uh, influenced his thinking uh, and placed him in that context. So I'll just start. He wrote many, many, many things, and then there have been many posthumous collections of his work and so on. So I, I wouldn't bother filling the screen with every single work. Um, the most famous work, of course, is the second one here, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, the one on the right, Cultural Action for Freedom. Um, these are all core texts of the Freirean canon. Um, and I'm really interested. I'm going to speak a bit and then I'm really interested in hearing questions and hopefully facilitating a conversation uh, we got a decent turnout today, so the, my assumption is that there's people out there who already are interested in Freire and probably have something to tell me and tell the group uh, about their how they've intersected with Freire in their lives and work. I do want to just do a quick snapshot, though, to show that Paolo Freire, though he died in 1997, uh, his work is um, is as alive as ever. And just a very quick search, um, I found uh, an international conference on Paulo Freire at UCLA from, I think, three or four years ago, a number of schools and institutes named after Paulo Freire in Brazil, uh, a country from which he was exiled for a long time, um, and then, uh, again, was sort of revived as a great leader in education. There are Freire institutes all around the world. Um, the one in the middle there is uh, from Malta. Uh, the one on the left is the one from UCLA, I think. And just to grab a, two or three very recent titles, these titles, Revisiting Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Issues and Challenges in Early Childhood Education. Um, these are all have come out in the last decade. The Wiley Handbook of Paulo Freire. And I love this one on the right, Reinventing Paulo Freire, A Pedagogy of Love. And this was just a tiny handful. So um, Paulo Freire's ideas are... Uh, very much alive and well and being reinvented and um, re yeah, redefined, I would say, in new contexts. So I'm going to talk um, about historical context. 
I'm assuming those of you who are already interested in Freire and know his writings and his core ideas may not know much about the Latin American context in which he was formed. And so I thought that was probably my best contribution for today. I will talk about some of the most important concepts that we associate with Freire. And then again, I might point to a couple of ideas of continued relevance, but mostly I'm interested in a, a dialogue, which would be very Frarian, uh, a dialogue with all of you about um, what interests you about Freire and about the topic. So Paulo Freire, um, and this isn't just background, this is really interesting, I would say. I, this is actually information that wasn't at my fingertips in 1988 when I was in my early 20s. And I'm not sure I could have made much sense of it at that time anyway, because I didn't have enough breadth of knowledge in Latin American history more broadly. But Paulo Freire was born in the northeast of Brazil um, in, um, in Recife. And uh, at the time, so the northeast of Brazil is historically the first part of Brazil that was colonized by the Portuguese. It was extremely wealthy in the colonial era, wealthy for those at the top of society, but it was also part of the northeastern slave plantation economy. Um, that whole northeast by the 20th century was by far the poorest part of Brazil in rural areas. Um, and so um, Paulo Freire grew up in a, a world of contrasts. Um, uh, he grew up in Pernambuco at first, the, the capital of Recife, and was from a middle-class family, a pretty middling, comfortable family in his early childhood. So he was born in 1921. Like many other really important figures and people I know personally, uh, he was deeply marked, uh, he and his family circumstances were deeply marked by the Depression. People might not realize um, how hard the Depression hit in Latin America. Uh, usually when we hear about the Depression of the 1930s, we think about Canada and the United States and maybe Western Europe. But the Depression hit Latin America uh, very, very hard as international markets for their export goods just dried up overnight. And Paulo Freire's family uh, just fell into abject poverty um, around when he turned nine or 10. And soon after that, his father died. And so like many interesting political leaders and thinkers and reformers and revolutionaries of the 20th century in Latin America, I think it's important that he had this kind of liminal early experience um, of moving, of being middle-class, living in really abject poverty and eventually climbing his way back into the middle class. But he had a life experience that really, really marked him. Um, apparently he was so hungry and so unable to concentrate that he lost four years of public schooling. He was held back four years. And in interviews, he later said, um, it wasn't that I wasn't smart enough and it wasn't that I wasn't motivated. It was that I was so hungry, I, I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't learn under those conditions. And so in his personal body, he experienced that shift between what it was to be middle class and what it was to be part of the, the truly poor in Brazil, which then and today is one of the most unequal societies on the planet. And so to be poor in Brazil is to be very, very, very poor. So that that experience really marked him. And we'll come back later and I'll suggest the names of a couple of other interesting people of roughly his uh, same generation who had somewhat similar experiences. So by the time he was of age, or I think a little bit late, I think he may have been in his early 20s, his family had recovered their standing enough for him to go to university. And he did what a good educated, sort of respectable Latin American man did. Traditionally, he studied law. This is what you did. You became a, 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 law, a lawyer. So he studied law at the Universidad de Pernambuco, and he did the full law degree. Law was really considered one of the core, most respectable uh, fields of study, and that dated back to the colonial era. The Spanish and the Portuguese really valued law and legal training, but he didn't like it. 
and he hated the teaching methods. He hated the pretense. Uh, he hated the flowery language, the, uh, and he, it felt useless to him. And so he actually put himself through law school by teaching high school, and then he never practiced law. He, uh, he just continued to be a high school teacher and dedicated the rest of his life to education. He never practiced law. Uh, I couldn't find any evidence of this, but you kind of think maybe he did it because his mom expected him to. <laughs> um, you know, it was the respectable thing to do, and then he didn't stick with it. So um, Prairie worked in secondary education, and then he was became part of the sort of education extension program of the University of Pernambuco and moved up into sort of education administration and policy. And he embarked um, on an early project of adult literacy. Uh, some of his first experiments took place in the 1940s. And now I cut out some slides because I didn't want us to get into the intricacies of Brazilian politics. But suffice to say, although Freire's ideas seem new once they were translated, in fact, he was part of a whole generation of uh, educational reformers in Brazil and even inherited from a previous generation. There was a lot of intellectual debate in Brazil already about how to reach, how to sort of expand um, public education, popular education, expand literacy, and basically prepare the Brazilian population for modernity. Um, there were horrendous illiteracy rates. Um, and uh, so Freire undertook an experiment in the 1940s in the countryside, in the back um, sort of hinterland of, um, of Pernambuco, and this is a part of Brazil known as the Sertão, um, which is translated sometimes as the backlands or the scrublands. This is a really desperately poor, dry, rocky part of Brazil that in Brazilian sort of culture of the early 20th centuries, I would say it was sort of comparable to Appalachia in the United States. Uh, stereotypes of, of backwardness, illiteracy, which was widespread, and um, sort of intellectuals in Brazil wrote about the differences between the cities as sites of civilization and the Sertão as a backward world of barbarism. Sort of uh, that maybe debates about whether the, the people of the Sertão, the, the impoverished rural people of Brazil, could even be incorporated into a modernizing world. So Freire undertook uh, grassroots literacy projects with adults, with impoverished, uh, illiterate adults. And this is where he started to experiment um, with methods to reach adult learners in ways that would make the education not only more relevant to them um, in terms of using materials that would be not childish, but would be appropriate to their age, but also that would uh, expand their sense of themselves as citizens. Uh, and so later on, he would theorize about, about this, but this is where he starts practicing. Uh, so in theory, these projects were about literacy, about teaching people to read and write. Um, but Freire had pretty high ambitions for this literacy training, that it wasn't really just about teaching people to learn and write, but also about an ideal which he would come to call conscientisation, which is sometimes translated into English as consciousness raising, which was a pretty common term, say in the 1960s, uh, or sometimes critical consciousness. Um, in other words, to prepare these people not just to read and write, but to um, take on the full, uh, the full rights of citizenship um, from which they had really been uh, excluded. So let me just, so, he developed um, this method that is kind of foundational to the Freirean method, which was instead of teaching, the teacher teaching with prepared school books, um, first of all, he didn't want to use childish school books, but he didn't even want to create, say, primers um, ahead of time that delivered a curriculum of, of learning to students. Instead, the method that Freire developed was to create what came to be called cultural circles, uh, basically community dialogue spaces of discussion 
where the members, the adult students and members of the community would discuss their own lives, the issues facing their community, the problems they faced, and tell the stories that were important to them. And the literacy facilitator would take down those stories and that vocabulary and then build the teaching materials out of that reality, out of that language. And so they believed quite strongly that you should in help people to learn to read in the vernacular that they actually used rather than imposing a sort of formal vocabulary on people. And that the learning itself would have more meaning if it built out of people's lived realities. Eventually, as I'll show you in a minute, Frary came to be much more interested in the sort of political consciousness raising than the literacy per se. And he came to have very high expectations of what one could achieve in terms of grassroots organizing um, through these kinds of circles. Now, I could go on and on about this, but I will try to keep, I won't. I just want to put Frary, though, into a context of the post-World War II period. So 1945, say right up until about the Cuban Revolution of 1959, the beginning of 1960. Again, Frary was not unique in his preoccupation with um, enfranchising the poor in Brazil, the poor and the illiterate. Uh, Latin American politics up until the early 20th century had been oligarch politics, basically. The political systems were controlled completely by elites, uh, there were usually sham elections um, or, or uh, skirmishes for power among caudillos or strongmen. Um, but for instance, in Brazil, there was a literacy requirement to vote. And I think at the turn of the 20th century, only 16% of the Brazilian population uh, met the requirements to be allowed to vote. Um, and so there had been a historic disenfranchisement uh, massive across the continent. and. Out of patterns of urbanization, like elsewhere, um, and eventually industrialization, especially in a country like Brazil, as well as Argentina and Mexico and Chile, there starts to be a pressure to um, incorporate uh, the poor, el pueblo, often poorly defined, the people, uh, the masses, um, whether those be working class, urban working class, or rural poor, uh, finding new ways to incorporate them into the political system. So in from the end of World War II and basically the worldwide repudiation of fascism, there is a kind of progressive opening in Latin America um, where military and sort of neo-fascist, sort of fascist sympathizers of the 1930s and early 40s were somewhat discredited once fascism failed in Europe. And there was a kind of reformist opening. And I won't get into all the details, but let me just tell you a couple of examples. So the, the colored image, the colorful image there on the top is uh, uh, an image from the Brazilian Estado Novo, which was a kind of, mm, kind of fascist, uh, modernizing nationalist movement um, that aimed to sort of modernize from the top down uh, the Brazilian economy and the Brazilian state, and with a lot of sort of propaganda and mass political movements somewhat modeled on um, Mussolini in Italy. Um, yet there were other more reformist movements um, that involved really expanding the rights of citizenship and bringing people into those rights who had been left out before. And I don't wanna say that these were always top-down movements at all. If we were in my course where I could go into more detail, I would be able to show that what there is is a kind of a dialogue in the 40s and 50s between middle class people like um, Frary, people of education, um, the person in the middle picture there, it, this pictures are a bit small, that's, that's Fidel Castro, surrounded by rural campesinos in Cuba, Fidel Castro also trained as a lawyer also well in touch with the rural poor, not because he was poor, but because he lived in a rural area of Cuba. Um, and the figure on the right, the picture on the right with that billboard is a, an image from um, the Guatemalan Democratic Spring, a period of, of reform between 1944 and 54, 
which culminated first in um, a, an ambitious land reform that was not only going to distribute land to poor indigenous people in, in Guatemala, but in fact also give them rights in rural sort of cooperative community uh, organizations to also make claims about land that they felt should be expropriated for that land reform. The picture on the bottom of the bus, uh, or the, uh, I guess, tram, is uh, our workers who supported Juan Perón in Argentina. Uh, again, the Peronist movement was in some ways a manipulative, top-down political movement, but in other ways, it was a working class movement and pressure to be included in the political system. And the picture at the bottom right is from the Bolivian Revolution of 1952, uh, which again was quite reformist, but uh, for the first time in Bolivian history, gave the vote to indigenous people in 1952. So these are just all examples of different attempts to uh, incorporate a broader uh, scope of people into political uh, decision making um, and into sort of the life of citizenship. So I would put Freire in that context uh, in terms of his life experiences uh, and um, again, we could talk. I, I won't go on because other people might have examples, but so what are some of the key ideas? These are key ideas that he developed in this work he was doing in Brazil and that later were formulated and became parts of the uh, sort of basic Frarian method. And again, I'm just going to talk about a couple. The biggest thing, I say one of the biggest ideas from Freire is a critique of what he called the banking model of education. And um, the banking model basically was a model that considered that the educator, uh, I'll speak of myself because I'm a university professor, so a formal educator, it could be a community facilitator, but the, the educator um, holds all the information, all the knowledge and all the power, and the, t the student is like the piggy bank here, and the educator simply deposits a sort of objective knowledge into the brain of the student. Now, looking back from the vantage point of 2020, you might kind of go, well, everybody knows that's not true. Uh, that's not really how learning works. Well, I would tell you that Freire was one of the first people to, one of the first people to articulate it um, in, a, in a big way uh, and talk about the dangers and the limitations of this movement, this kind of thinking for his whole career. So in the banking model, the teacher is the active holder of knowledge, creator of knowledge, narrator, conveyor of knowledge, and of course, they have all the power. They stand above the student who is a mere passive receptacle for uh, knowledge that has been pre-packaged uh, and pre-digested by the instructor. Um, now, I think that um, Freire developed these ideas partly through what he found to be meaningful in the work he did as a teacher and what he had found to be so frustrating in his own experiences as a student. Uh, the social conditions in which he found himself as a, as a schoolboy made it impossible for him to learn. And yet the method uh, did not, was not able to reach him. The method did not reach him. Nobody made the effort to address the conditions uh, that prevented him from learning. And then at university, he found himself surrounded by trappings of sort of elite high culture that struck him as ridiculous uh, and very reactionary. So, and I think some of us can see ourselves in this picture. And I, I know that sometimes I teach like this and then I don't feel very good about it because I've been thinking about these ideas for a long time. Ferry says the teacher acts in the banking model and the students have the illusion of acting through the actions of the teacher. And I would say, maybe we could talk about this to anybody else who's an educator. I think those of us who teach can trick ourselves. I think we can trick ourselves in that our students are learning through the illusion of our own effort. In other words, because we're exhausted, because we exhaust ourselves preparing and thinking and planning and delivering we think there's something active going on, but of course we have exhausted ourselves. We don't really know uh, whether, if we haven't engaged our students to do anything, um, is it just a performance or is it meaningful at all? So to counter this sort of banking model, um, 
Freire, his whole life stressed the importance of what he calls dialogic education. Again, did Paulo Freire make this up? No, I believe Socrates made this up. Um, but certainly Paulo Freire gave it a different political twist. Um, and so Freire argued that there could be no real learning unless the educator or facilitator and the student recognized in each other a basic humanity and a basic uh, respect and understanding that each has something to offer the other, that each has something to teach and learn. Uh, that as long as there's a hierarchical view of education, um, the educator is always putting their own humanity basically above their students. And again, because uh, Freire and people influenced by Freire are much more interested in the political implications of education. Uh, this was not simply, oh, the most effective way to get people to learn their letters and how to read and write, but that this foundational dialogue was key to democratic life and full citizenship. Um, and it's interesting because in another area of my life, well, a related area of my life, since those years that I was interested in Freire and more recent years, I've really become very interested in contemplative pedagogy um, and methods of uh, meditation and um, journaling and deep listening that can be brought into the classroom. And, you know, when I was putting this together today, I thought, oh, that makes perfect sense because the most important contemplative practice to be brought in the classroom is really what we would call mindful listening or mindful communication. And basically, that's just, I realized that just took me all the way back to Freire again. Um, that real learning happens when a, an adequate space is created for people to hear each other uh, in both directions. So in his early years, I won't get into the details. He was moved up um, within the, uh, the, the um, education system, particularly uh, under reformist um, sort of populist government in Brazil. And he was able to start to practice his theories on a larger scale, um, not just his own experiments, but start to train people and practice the sort of mm, experiment in mass literacy, not nationwide, but regional. And all of that looks great. There was a lot of support. And then, of course, there was a military coup. And in 1964, um, the military took power in Brazil. And uh, I think that you could say that Freire ran up against the political realities uh, of the larger political system in which he was operating, that there is the micro level of this dialogue you create, um, but you are also, of course, living within a broader political context. And unfortunately, uh, this was the Cold War context in Latin America that by uh, the mid-1960s and then the 1970s, uh, the militaries of Latin America, backed by the United States in many cases, um, worked to overthrow and crush um, grassroots movements like the kinds that Freire was trying to foment. Um, peasant cooperatives, uh, labor unions, um, and there were, of course, guerrilla movements that had also exploded across the continent, um, and they attracted some of this backlash. So Freire himself uh, was arrested when the Brazilian military took power in 1964. He was held for about a month and a half, uh, and he was forced into exile. And from Brazil, he went to Chile. Um, this was the 1960s, so it was not yet the years of Salvador Allende's um, socialist government, but Chilean society was moving. There was a lot of reformist movement. Chilean politics were moving towards the left. Uh, it was a Christian democratic government in power, and Freire went there and worked in Chile to build many of his educational experiments. The honors thesis I wrote was actually about Freire's ideas and also about their um, implementation in Chile. Um, and what happened, I would say, in Chile, and it happened again in Nicaragua, where uh, Freire also advised the Sandinista government, was that once the uh, practice of Freirean education was expanded to 
a national level and incorporated into a sort of government run uh, effort at mass literacy, it lost uh, its not, not surprisingly, it lost a lot of its grassroots character. Uh, governments were so tempted to not honor the idea that you let the reality and the material emerge organically from below, but rather that you teach adults by uh, creating top-down materials from the government to be distributed. Um, and so in the Chilean case, interestingly, um, the Christian Democratic Reformist government um, of the late 60s, the Allende government of 1970 to 73, and even, believe it or not, the Pinochet dictatorship all claimed to use Ferry's methods uh, in their adult education efforts. Each of them, well, the Pinochet version, a complete violation of everything Ferry uh, believed in because instead the Pinochet regime threw out the old teaching materials and created these propaganda materials um, to undo the sort of socialist uh, contamination of the Allende years. Freire found himself moving from country to country in exile, as did so many uh, activists and intellectuals from Latin America in these years. So from Brazil, he went to Chile. From Chile, he was invited to Harvard uh, and then couldn't go back to Chile because of the coup. And from the United States, he went to Geneva, where he lived for many years, um, working as an education advisor to the World Council of Churches. And as uh, Brazil opened up again politically, the dictatorship ended in 1985, and I believe it was 1990 that Freire moved back to Brazil, once again became an influential force in uh, Brazilian education reform, and then died in 1997. So. I just wanted to, uh, again, talk a little bit, and I'm almost done, and then I wanna hear what other people have to say. Um, the most important book that Freire came out with, he was in Chile. So when he was in Chile, in exile, now out of harm's way, and with a bit of space to think and to theorize about what he had been trying to do in Brazil, this is when he sat down and wrote wrote the work that is most famous and most widely read called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, so he, it was came out in uh, publication first in 1968. So again, if we were in a regular classroom, I would now say, what else was happening in 1968? So 1968 in Latin America, as in other parts of the world, was <clears throat> just about the high point, one of the beginning of in Latin America, a high point of activism, of radical movements, of student movements, of mass labor mobilizations. Um, in 1968, the um, student movement in Mexico uh, protested against the Olympics in Mexico and were fired upon in the massacre at Tlatelolco, which was one of the great, uh, most shocking sort of political movements in the world around the student movement um, backlash. Um, 1968, um, I wanted to put it in the context of the 1960s. Uh, when the pedagogy of the oppressed comes out, it's seven years after Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, you know, one of the great uh, works of post-colonial sort of revolutionary thinking. And interestingly, I read that, I didn't know this back when I wrote my thesis, not, not surprisingly, um, when Freire was working on the pedagogy of the oppressed in Chile, some young activist who came to Chile from I don't know where, gave him a copy of Franz Fanon's book, which he hadn't heard of yet. And he apparently had almost finished writing the pedagogy of the oppressed. And then he sat down to read The Wretched of the Earth and then he said he had to throw out the pedagogy of the oppressed and start over again. So the pedagogy of the oppressed is in many ways in dialogue with Franz Fanon's uh, writings and thinkings about how the oppressed, the colonized, um, the wretched of the earth can throw off an imperialist mindset, can sort of um, cleanse themselves of the oppressive thinking that has held them down. Uh, and so Freire now is in this more internationalist context of decolonization debates and movements in Africa 
Um, and he ends up, again, becoming a voice uh, in contact with people also in India uh, and other parts of South Africa. He becomes very influential in the South African um, anti-apartheid movement, uh, a big influence on Steve Biko, apparently. And, you know, the, the um, pedagogy of the oppressed also comes out in 1968, right after the year, just maybe a few months after the death of Che Guevara. Now, Che Guevara, I was thinking of as an interesting, uh, almost contemporary. He's a little bit younger than Ferry, but he was born in the 1920s as well, at the end of the decade. Weirdly, he was born the same year as my own father, which is really hard for me to compute. Um, it always struck me as very strange. Che Guevara, after having been become this revolutionary hero in the Cuban Revolution, had then tried to continue to foment revolutions. He'd gone to Angola to fight in the uh, Angola um, anti-civil uh, war, and then he'd gone to Bolivia. And his Bolivian campaign, by all accounts, was a complete disaster. And he was hunted down and executed in 1967 um, by Bol Bolivian armed forces with help from the United States. Yet, interestingly, that did nothing to discredit Che Guevara. It actually um, fueled the sort of Che Guevara cult. So when Paulo Freire's book came out in 1968, it absolutely resonated with a moment, um, pro probably one of the very high points of revolutionary um, fervor in Latin America, and of course, then the anti-revolutionary backlash to come. Um, so, oh, and I was gonna say, the other reason that I think Che Guevara is an interesting um, contemporary is because he had tied, he was middle class uh, in his childhood, and he had some family ties to the Argentine upper class, but he, because of his own health problems and because his father couldn't quite get his act together, um, they were on the edge of poverty a good part of his childhood. They moved a lot. They lived a very unstable life. And he had a lot of, uh, his mother, a bit like Prairie, was very opposed to the typical pretense of the Latin American middle class. She was very open to have poor kids in and out of the house. And again, uh, I think between that and Che's travels around Latin America and his famous motorcycle travels, I think gave him something of a similar experience. Um, less dire, definitely less dire than Ferry, but I think fueled this kind of preoccupation with uh, how do we solve this deep problem of inequality in Latin America. So that is it for my formal presentation. I think, yep. All right. Thank you very much, Karen. This video was published by the ndmediacoop.org in New Brunswick, Canada.